Well, Glenn said he was going to put tape up here for me, so I had to stay inside the boundary lines. But he didn't know the title of my message was Uncaged, so we'll see how that goes. <laughs> stay in the view of the, the camera here. Um, I want to talk to you all tonight about how I was caged in emotions. Uh, growing up, I was caged in emotions of anger and, and worry and anxiety, and I'd suppress those things growing up, and I just didn't know what to do, them, do with them. And uh, I, I heard a quote that said, emotions are like our kids, you know, we can't let them drive the car and we can't put them in the trunk. <laughs> you know, I that true. So I want to open up with a, <laughs> with a scripture there. You know, don't try to put your kids in the, tr- in the trunk. Um, um, Philippians 4, 6 through 8, and I'm going to read it out of the Passion Translation, but if you guys want to go there in your Bible and, and read that. And it says... Don't be pulled in different directions or worried about a thing. Be saturated in prayer throughout each day, offering your faith-filled requests before God with overflowing gratitude. Tell him every detail of your life. Then God's wonderful peace that transcends human understanding will make the answers known to you through Jesus Christ. So keep your thoughts continually fixed on all that is authentic and real, honorable and admirable, beautiful, respectful, pure, and holy, merciful, and kind, and fasten your thoughts on every glorious work of God, praising Him always. Amen to that. I just love that it says saturated in prayer. I mean, just give it all, get it all, get it all out. I had to come to an understanding of, of self-awareness, and I'll, I'll touch on a couple points talking about self-awareness. And what that was, is for me, was, you know, bringing, we all have emotions, but bringing all that into consciousness, bringing it all into one picture and, you know, being self-aware of it. Uh, consciousness is like a, a state of being awake, of one's surroundings. And I didn't know growing up what to do with it. You know, I'd feel this stuff. I was like, what in the world is going on with me? And I didn't collectively pull it in and say, Lord, take care of this. I don't know what, I don't know what to do with it. I wasn't, ta- I wasn't self-aware of what to do with it. And we know in 2 Timothy 1.7, and you all know this scripture, and we can put it up on the board. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. And there's nothing better than when your four-year-old, five-year-old wants to write that on a window, on a, on a mirror, and you walk in like, praise God, that's good. And, uh, but a sound mind. I didn't know what a sound mind was until, gosh, a couple years ago. And you know, I still work on this every single day, having, renewing, having a sound mind, and Man, that just unlocks things right there. Um, yeah, Ellie wrote that one on the bathroom window, and it just wrecked you every a bathroom mirror, and it just wrecked you every time you read it. I didn't realize too that with hurts uh, growing up through um, emotions, I was taking on these emotions, and I didn't realize that events happening maybe earlier in a day um, that I was bringing home later it was creating an emotion because I was suppressing something that hit me earlier on that day. And I know that out of that, it not only affected myself, but it was affecting my family. And, you know, whether it been at work or, you know, school or wherever you you, you may be, maybe it's even a family function, who knows, whatever it is for you all. For me, you know, I'd take something on at work, and then I'd, something, someone would say something that would offend me. And I would take it on, I'd say, all right, now, whatever, I'll just, I'll deal with it later, it didn't really hurt that bad. Eight hours later, I'm sitting in the kitchen, and I'm mad for some reason. I have no clue where that came from. It's because I suppressed it. I didn't deal with it. I didn't take it to the Lord when it hit me the first time. So out of an event, it created this emotion, and it was just unlocking a door to things that weren't of God. Um, You know, our emotions are not, you know, they're God-given. God gave us emotions, and they're not bad. But they're not made to run your life or ruin your life. They're not made to do that. And, you know, if, if you allow emotions to run and ruin your life through those, they'll start unlocking doors of spirits. And they, and they did for me through um, hurt from family, through unforgiveness, through anger. It would open up, and I'd and I feel that uh, spirit. I feel, for me, it was a spirit of depression, you know, being 16, 17 years old and being depressed. How in the world do I deal with this? Then at 20, married, 21 with a kid and just built a house, I'm depressed and I'm suppressing things and I'm not dealing with emotions and I'm opening up the doors for spirit to come in. It would lead to just 
chaos in my life. And I know that's not from God. And uh, I'm going to also read, I think, do we have 2 Corinthians 10, 5, and 5 through 6? I don't think I gave that to you. No, I, I'll write it down here. I got it in the Passion Translation. I'll read it real quick. And it says, we can demolish every deceptive fantasy that opposes God and break through every arrogant attitude that is raised up in defiance of the true knowledge of God. We capture like prisoners of war every thought and, and, and instance that is that it bow in obedience to the anointed one. Since we are armed with such dyma- dynamic weaponry, we stand ready to punish any trace of rebellion as soon as you choose to complete uh, as you choose complete obedience. I had to write all that down. We didn't have it up there on the screen, so my notes are all over the place. I was thinking about, if any of y'all have been to my house, and some of y'all have, you know, I'm a collector of guns. I have that that big gun case I like to look through. And um, I was thinking about how my father has given me a lot of those guns. They're hand-me-downs. You know, they're, they're, they're not even toys. They're just put them away. Sons will get them later. And that's kind of how he did it with me. And uh, I thought about that. I was thinking about it actually last night. I said, I've got all that weaponry. I've got all that weaponry. And if I never ask my father for the combination to how to unlock it, then it does me no good and just sits there. And, you know, it's not out of a spirit of fear that I ha- have those, but I just thought to myself, they're there. Because if I didn't ask my father how to deal with these situations and something happened, I'd be standing there with a stick and not be able to fight my way out of it. So, you know, the Father has given you so, so much, the dynamic weaponry. And we stand ready. And we have to stand ready. And I know with me, I had to locate a lot of trigger points, um, identifying those things. I had to stop self-talk. I know Pastor talked, he had a message a while back, and he talked about um, nursing. Don't nurse, don't rehearse, but reverse. And that really stuck with me because if I sit and have self-talk, you know, keep playing it back in myself. Who knows where, you know, you know, you know where yourself, you know, when you talk to yourself, where it takes you. And I learned for myself that what it was when I started playing that back in my head is I started playing the victim. I started, you know, sucking myself into the victim mentality. You know, because it feels good. It feels good to get the attention of, you know, this problem is going on in my life or, this happened to me at work, and you start, I, start, I started playing through all this stuff, and then what's it get? It gets the attention. Oh, well, why is that going on like that? Well, buddy, you, you can't let those things happen to you. You start getting that attention, and through that victim mentality, it gave me a sense of control and manipulation because not only that was I playing this victim mentality to get attention, then I could sit there and manipulate someone to pay into what I'm talking about, pay into... And then what was I doing? That, I was unlocking that spirit of con- tr- control and manipulation. And it was unhealthy. Unhealthy for my marriage. I mean, I, I've even noticed that it just came to, you know, even with, even with my kids, you know, if, if I sat and tried to play that, well, I can't do that right now. I am, you know, I'm super busy and I start playing that like it's all on, it's, it's, it's my, you know, I'm the victim in the situation. Then you, I kind of can, you can kind of manipulate them out of it. You know what I mean? You kind of take that control out of the relationship. Did I give you First Peter 5 eight? I love how it says it in the Amplified. And it says, Be well balanced, tempered, sober of mind, be vigilant and cautious at all times, for that enemy of yours, the devil, roams around like a lion roaring in fierce hunger, seeking someone to size up and devour. I wrote down, be sober, well-balanced, and self-disciplined. We have to be sober-minded. You know, in that hectic situation, be sober-minded, be be disciplined. I think with that self-awareness comes self-discipline, well-balanced. Be alert and cautious at all times. That's not, that's not be, be worried. I'm not talking about be worried at all times. Be alert. Be on, your, you know, be on your toes. Know that you're a victor. You're fighting from victory. You can stand alert. You can't stop the thought from coming, but you can stop it from defining you. 
You can. And I found myself at many times in my life that I found that I can use family, for instance. I'd get mad at a family function. Why? I don't know. I started taking something on. I didn't realize what I was taking on. And then I'd get mad and I'd release anger. I'd take it out on someone else. I was mad at myself because now I'm aggravated. And you know, it just spirals one thing after another and I was letting it define who I was and that's not who I was because that's not what God says about me. I'm not anger. That's not what he says. But I was letting that define me. I was letting it grow. I was growing something that wasn't of God. Uh, Ashley laughs at me all the time because I said, you know, Dave Ramsey has the nerd and the free spirit. And I'm like, we're the thinker and the feeler. You know, she's, everything's got to be logical and played out. What's the answer to it? She's great with math. There's one answer to it. Me, I'm like, man, it just feels so good. God loves me. You know? <laughs> I said, people are going to think I'm crazy after this. But really, you start feeling things. And I, I thought her, I said, it's like on Monday, you're like, woo, everything's great. Tuesday, I'm worried about everything. And on Wednesday, I'm anxi- having anxiety. On Thursday, I'm mad about everything. And on Friday, I'm letting it all out. But Saturday, praise God, we got church tomorrow. <laughs> and it's just all over the place. It's like, I think people are more nervous about me being up here than I am about being up here. <laughs> like, he's letting it out. <laughs> letting it out. And then... Playing the answer, she says, well, what does God say about that? I mean, what does he say? Oh, I don't know, but I just don't feel that way. Well, stop. It's not how you feel. God love her. He blessed me with a wonderful woman. Um, I started thinking about, and I had talked about this on a, on a vlog, you know, in Mark 2, 8. I gave you that one. I always got to check myself. You know, Jesus, Jesus perceived in a spirit. Um, he was perceiving his spirit, and we perceive in our spirit. And if we perceive in our spirit and turn to God, then it releases fruit. But it's when we perceive in our flesh that we'll reap flesh. And I, and I know that personally, because if I perceived in my spirit something that was going on, and I took it straight to the Holy Spirit and said, what's going on? Where's this coming from? Why? What do you want me to do with it, God? Or if I took it on myself... Well, I can handle it. I can take care of it. Yeah. And what came out of it? It was flesh. It was. It was self. It was self-destructive. Um, you know, talking about the filler and thinker. You know, some of you, I think it's funny because here this man is talking about emotions up here. And all these women are like, he is crazy. <laughs> um, but we come into, you know, I, I feel sometimes, you, you come into a room, you can feel something. You know, you the Holy Spirit starts speaking to you. You know, you walk into work, something feels tense. I'm all right. Perceive it in my spirit. What's going on? What's God saying to me? You know, I just walked in here. I felt worried. I didn't feel worried before I walked in here. I, what am I taking on? What's going on? And with that, that's when I had to start, that's when I had to do in that start self-check. You start going through the, through the list. Is that me? How did I feel before I came in here? Okay. I feel like something, something's happening. And we're not led by, by our feelings. We're not led by our feelings. We're not led by our emotions. So if God's talking to you, I start thinking, you know, when I feel like that, I have to ask the Lord what to do with it. But I go to him straight in prayer. I start praying about it. You know, am, am I, I feel like am I interceding for someone? You know, do I, is the Lord speaking to me about someone? And, and with that, I have had to learn, for me personally, that... If I'm in a group, whatever it may be, and I'm, I feel that taken on, the Lord highlights someone to me, and, you know, maybe I felt worry. I'm not going to go over to that person and say, you yeah, know, I really feel like worry's on you today. I felt worry on me, and I think worry's on you. <laughs> but in return, instead of doing it like that, I just go, go ahead and go edify, uplift, encourage. How easy is that? You're not sure of the answer, so you're not going to go and drag somebody down because they're feeling worried or they're feeling angry. Man, you really looked angry today. You looked really off you need Jesus. <laughs> you know? You're not going to do that. You know, you're going to go over and encourage. You know, give them that corporate half hug. You know, high five. <laughs> you know, I talked about, you know, being angry and having no, explana- no explanation at all. You know, I've been worried for no reason. I've been anxious for no reason. And, you know, my poor wife, Sitting there, she said, what, what are you mad about? I don't know. 
I have no clue what I'm mad about. Have you asked God about it? No. There's none that's different. But you know what? God has grace. Yes, his grace is just amazing. And it's just so wonderful. Um, you know, I'm thinking about it, I have family functioning. And I talk about family because I can talk about myself. I can talk about family, right? No. Um, talk about allowing people to steal your peace. I know around the holidays about a year ago, at Journey Group, we are talking about letting people steal your peace. Don't let them steal your peace. And you take something on when you go to that Christmas dinner or whatever it is, and you start feeling that heaviness on top of you. And you're like, Adam said, don't let, start throwing that peace symbol up all the time. I said, it's like sitting there looking at people giving baseball signs across the room. You know, don't, don't let them steal your peace. Me and Ashley over there. <laughs> Ain't happening tonight. <laughs> you guys are going to start doing that. Just wait. All these spouses, you guys are going to go somewhere. You'll be giving the belt sign. You know, just down the line, you know that it's coming at you. Don't let them steal your peace. Here we go. Pulling on the ear. It is baseball season. <laughs> Bill Johnson had a quote, uh, quote from Bill Johnson. He said, if it didn't start in the heart of God, don't let it stay in your mind. Yeah. And I've had to take that to heart after hearing it. I mean, my goodness. And if it didn't start in the heart of God, then you don't need it. Don't think you need it. Amen. Don't think that you need, even if it felt good, if it's not of the heart of God, then don't keep it around. Um, I got Romans 8, 14 and 16. For as many are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you do not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit bears Himself. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. His Spirit bears witness with our spirit. He's in us. Can't pull... You've accepted him. You can't pull him out. You can't set him aside. Even though we can feed into our emotions, I've fed into them. I've allowed them to lead me down a path of destruction and chaos. He's still there in the mist with me saying, I'm in the mess. I'm in the mess. Listen to me. Don't let them lead you. And you know what? He he loves you so much. He's just kind of, I know for me, for me, I still hear him. And I've chose to ignore him sometimes. No, I got this. I got this, God. I got it. I got it. And then the next thing you know it, I'm in a frenzy, and I don't, and I'm like, I know you were there. You were there talking the whole time. Lord, forgive me. And what grace he has in forgiveness, you know, saying, Lord, I didn't listen to you that time. I know I didn't. And now I know. You were, te- you were teaching me. He wasn't taking you down that, but he was, he was ministering to me there. He was teaching me. You know, I was, I was caging myself. I was caging myself. I was putting myself in that cage. He, God wasn't doing that. That was the enemy sitting back and saying, he didn't even have to do any work because I did it to myself. I was be, being led by my emotions. So by doing that, the enemy didn't even have to do anything. I'm just going to sit back here and watch him do it to himself. You know, I'll, I, let's do this. Close your eyes real quick. Just close your eyes. And you see yourself sitting right there in the jail cell. And you're sitting there. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit stands at the gate, right there at the door. He hands you the keys. He rips off the door, and he throws the bars on the ground. Now, you have a choice. You can stand up and follow him right out, because there's nothing holding you back anymore. Or you can choose to sit there. He says, follow me. I love you. I have ripped down these doors because I love you. I have thrown you the keys to the kingdom. I have thrown you the keys to unlock the the shackles of bondage that are tied to your ankles. I have given you the keys. Unlock it and walk out and follow me. Follow him out and you're free. Go ahead. You can open your eyes. That always helps me to um, to, to vision him doing those things for me. If I feel encaged, I can imagine him ripping those doors down. He's tearing them off. Tearing them off. You know, I, I was thinking about that. When I was thinking about how I encaged myself, I started thinking about a uh, lion bred in captivity. Think about some of these animals bred in captivity. Bred in a zoo. 
And all they know is the enclosure that they've, they've been raised in. That's all they know. You know, you could take one of those lions and you go take them to a nature preserve and you can open the gate. Maybe they walk out, maybe they don't. But they have to learn to be free because they don't know how to be free. We have to learn how to be free. I had to learn how to be free. I didn't know how to be free. I sat and held myself down for so many years and trying to figure out why. Why am I here? Why am I in this situation? Why do I feel this way? Because I was allowing myself to be led by emotions instead of being led by the Spirit of God because He didn't put me in that cage. He brought me out of that cage and He has set me free. Amen. And He'll guide me the whole time Amen. I'm out there. Amen. Amen. Got Romans 12.2. Let's go to Romans 12.2. Romans 12, 2, and, we, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Do not be conformed to this world. That's what I was doing to myself. I was conforming myself to what the world said about me. I was conforming myself that I was depression, that I was anger. That's what the world would have said if they would have saw me in those times. I was conforming myself to the world instead of what he says about me. I wasn't being transformed by the renewing of my mind. I was trying to self-sustain and put my problems down in a bucket and never, talk, never look at them again, lock them in the trunk, lock them away instead of renewing my mind. He'll renew my mind. He did renew my mind, and he renews it every day. <coughs> that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Listen, all I had to do, and I continually have to do every day, is to remember to line my will up with his perfect will. Line my will up with his perfect will. In Psalm 23, it's, uh, he says, it says, he restores my soul. He restores my soul. And I kept saying that to myself, he restores my soul. I know he's restored my spirit. My spirit's made whole. My body will be renewed eventually. And I'm working on my soul, but he restores my soul. I wrote here, and this, this really helped me, is that if I didn't get the hurt out, I left it in there. If I didn't get it out, I had to get it out. And if you don't allow yourself to feel, you won't allow the God to heal. Ashley said that to me the other night. We were talking about this. And we were talking about some of the things that we've overcome together. We've worked through together. We've worked through in our marriage. And we've almost been married almost nine years this year. We got married when we were 19. 19 years old. We've worked through a lot of things together. And that's, if, if I didn't allow myself to feel the hurt and get it out, then I wasn't allowing God to get in there and heal it. I was not allowing him to get in there and do work. Let me tell you, he'll do a marvelous work. You know, I talked about, and this has just hit me, you know, talking about depression for me. My emotions lead me there. Um, my grandpa, he committed suicide my senior year of high school, uh, my last football game of my senior year. I took that on. I'm 18 years old, what do I do? And I started thinking, I can either let the decisions of others define who I am, or I can move past it and let God define who I am, show me who I am. And that was a turning point in my life, and it was a stepping stone to get past and say that the generational things that have been put on me are no longer going to bind me down. The generational things that my, that my family had had and said that these emotions that we've all dealt with for so many years that have tied us all down, we've all dealt with this, and, well, Christian, that's just how it is. Well, you know, I just have a, you know, you just have a drink, you might have a drinking problem because, you know, a couple of your family members had a drinking problem. Or, Christian, you might just have depression because your grandpa had depression. Well, that's not who I am because that's not who God says I am. That's not who he says that I am. And, you know, and I, I could have so easily, so many times, allowed myself to get sucked into those emotions and with those emotions opened the doors to some spirit that was unwanted and not of God and just sat and soaked in it and let something other than the Lord lead me. 
And I had to turn it around. I had to turn it around. I had to recalculate. Recalculate. I had to recalculate and absolutely, absolutely recalculating. I was going down a winding road that would have left me, I don't know where. But I tell you what, I'm in a better place today. And he's continuing to just, every time, every time I get off track, he just recalculates where I go. I want to give you guys some points, some, some, some do nots, some don'ts, and some do's to how this has helped me work through it. A do not. Do not meditate or give time to things that produce hopelessness. If it leads to hopelessness, just stop it. Just stop it. <laughs> It'll take you to nowhere land. It really will. It will take you no that hopelessness will take you nowhere. Your spirit needs hope. Your spirit needs hope. That's spirit food. Your spirit needs worship and praise and everything that is good of God. That's what you need. Number two, do not play things out in your head without God and truth. So many times I have done that. Man, I wonder what they think about me. Man, I bet they're talking about me. Man, I wonder what they'd say about me when I'm not around them. Why am I playing that out in my head? Why? Did God say that about me? No. Is it build me up? No. It's not a him. Stop playing it out in your head. Don't, do not snowball your failures. One failure after another. And don't disqualify yourself. I was talking about you know, alcoholism for a second. Depression. Anxiety. I could have let those just snowball one after another. That snowball effect and just let them grow. And just let them grow. I'm not going to sit and meditate on that. It didn't get me anywhere. This is a big one for, you know, I think now, is don't, do not follow people on social media that provoke you to anger, jealousy, or discouragement. Why are you going to sit and look at stuff that's going to discourage you? We got off social media uh, a, couple years, a couple years ago. We're back on now. We're back on. And, uh, but that was one of the things. You know, I got tired of seeing people's junk. You ta you'll take that on. If you let it in, you'll take it on. You let it in, you take it on. Why are you going to sit and look at someone's pictures that make you feel jealous? That's not God. Stop looking at it. Snooze them for 30 days and get rid of it. <laughs> Snooze them. Snooze them. Or d take a break. How much time do we spend on our phones looking at it instead of spending it talking to God? I, t I, I started talking about this. I think I shared it at a breakfast. I changed, the, I changed the apps on my phone. You know, you usually open up your iPhone and the first four apps on your phone are usually your, your phone app, your call contacts, your messages, your Safari browser, and usually your camera. I know I told these, the guys at breakfast one morning, I said, why do we always, as soon as we have an issue or a problem, the first thing we do is pick up our phone and we want to call somebody and talk to them about it. We want to text somebody. As soon as something, man, i got to text them about that real quick. I wonder what they'll say about it. I'm going to start doing my T.D. Jakes impression here in a minute. So, or you, you know, you go to your text messages and start texting them. Or you try to WebMD your problems. Do we not? You start trying to, well, I wonder if there's something on Pinterest I can find to get rid of that foot fungus. You know what I mean? <laughs> why not ask God about it? <laughs> you know, why not? Or how can I, what's a home, what's a home remedy for a cold? I'm, it happens. We do it. Do we not? We get on the browser. Take it to him. See what God says about it. I bet he's got something that will heal it. He's got something that will heal the blood of Christ. That's what will heal it. And the camera. I was thinking about that camera. We take, a, <laughs> we take a picture of it. How quick are we to take a picture of our problems and post them? We want to take a mental image and keep it. We want to store that little problem away. We want to take a mental note of the issue and put it in our pocket and save it for a rainy day when not someone can feel sorry for me and I can play victim and get attention and then I can control someone and manipulate them into feeling how I feel. Number five, do not join the complainer group. We got group text messaging. Don't start the complainer group. 
One complaint after another, sorrow upon sorrow, will lead you nowhere. I'll leave that group. Number six, do not watch negative shows, movies, news channels, if you already deal with anxiety, depression, anger, negativity. We, I'll tell you, this is one thing that we've done in our house, and we really don't use it a whole lot. We got rid of direct TV, and we had to go with the fire stick or whatever. But for a couple weeks, we took our... T- <laughs> yeah. A couple weeks, we took, that, we took that, that TV out. And what were we doing? Playing game, connect, connect four in the floor. Uno. Tell you what, my five-year-old's pretty good at Uno. You start taking that stuff out and stop paying attention to it and see, see how much better you feel. See how much better you feel. I love, when I grew up, growing up, I'm still growing up. He's still growing me right now. He's still growing me right now. I used to love watching scary movies. I did. Every Halloween. That's all. I, I loved it. But I started realizing that I was opening up doors. I already had vivid dreams. I was already in a spiritual battle. I was already having dreams that were not from God because that was the way that the enemy could infiltrate while I was resting. And I sat there and let it feed in all day when I would sit there in front of that TV. The news started making me feel paranoid. Why am I watching this? The whole, when I was in the army, I just remember just sitting and watching. Man, I wonder if we're going to do this. I wonder if we're going to do that. What's going to happen? You start feeling anxiety. Turn that thing off. Turn that thing off. I know it's hard. It's everywhere. It is. In football season, you know, that TV turns right back on. But, you know, you've got you to gotta, you gotta be aware of what you're doing. You've got to be aware of what you're, what you're watching, what you're taking in. You know, if you're, if you're sitting there watching it and your kids are in the house, they're taking it in too. You don't, think, you don't think that they are. You don't think that they're paying attention to what you're doing. They're watching everything that you're doing. They're watching everything that you're doing. Um. I'll ask you this, and I, and I, heard, and I heard this, this, and you probably have too. Um, there are two wolves. One is darkness and despair, and one is light and hope. They're both fighting. Which one wins? Whichever one you feed. It's whichever one you feed. It will grow stronger. Joe Harris said this to me one day. He said, don't feed the beast. Said, Amen, brother. Don't feed the beast. We were talking about the top of the bag, and I said, I said, man, we just can't, can't give into it. He said, don't feed the beast. Absolutely, don't feed the beast. Because if you feed into it, it'll grow stronger. It'll grow stronger, and then you'll find yourself overcome by something that's not of God. So let me give you guys some, some, some do's. Some things that helped me and continue to help me each and every day. I wanted to, I wanted to you know, talk to you about something that, that I... We all deal with this. We deal with emotions every day. They, they come at us all the time. First thing I do is I have to change my thought pattern. I know pastors talk about it. You keep going down the same path. It wears a rut, and then it's just as easy just to go right down that path. You have to change your, your thought path. You have to take those thoughts captive. You have to. If you don't, you just allow yourself to just, how easy is it just to walk down that same old path again? I found myself there at like 19 years old, married. Man, I'm out in the world. I'm married. Now what? You know? I've taken myself down a path that, that didn't need to be instead of saying, you know what, this marriage is going to be strong. It's going to last. Start speaking blessing over my marriage. Start singing, start singing song of praise over everything. That's something we do. Number two, feast on God's love. We have to feast on God's love. We have to focus on His love. We have to focus on God's love. I love, it's encouraging when I come home and my wife looks at me and says, man, I was feasting on God's love today. Whew. That'll make you fall in love again, won't it? Like, okay, I'll take some. Encourage others. Even in times that I feel down, I have to, it picks you, it picks you up to encourage someone else. If you're feeling, if you're feeling discouraged, go encourage. I'm serious. It helps me. It really does. It, it really helps me. Andrew Corns, every time I walk in, I don't care, I'm giving him a hug. He's standing back there looking good in his suit. I'm going to give him a hug and encourage him. Yeah, it doesn't matter. If you know me, I'm looking for all my huggers in the church. It's taken me about a year and a half to find who my huggers are. You might get one. Adam, Adam says, uh, well, he was a journey group one day. 
I'm just coming to it real quick. And the Lord told me, when I show up at Journey, go give him a hug. Okay. I love giving hugs. I walk in. Adam, stand up. What? Stand up. What? I got to give you a hug, man. Stand up. <laughs> Number four. I can pick up my journey group leader, right? Um, number four, help others. Don't ignore your problems, but stop thinking about yourself and go help someone. Stop thinking about yourself and go help someone. That's when God's going to work on you. That's when He's going. That's when He's going to do work. We're talking about the encouraging. Go help someone else. Whatever it is, when you're in that slump, go help someone. If it's your next door neighbor. Go help them. Someone taking the trash can to the curb. Run over there and do it real quick. Let me tell you something. He's going to minister to you while you run over there. He absolutely will. He does to me. Don't be afraid to share or call on others for encouragement and prayer. Don't do it. Don't be afraid. We're all going through something. We're all going through something. And I tell you what, half the time you think you can't talk to somebody about it, they've probably already went through it. Find someone that you, know, that you, can, you can talk to, open up to. Call someone, lean on them. Isn't that what we're there for? We always, we always say, I, I did this. I wish I had somebody I could talk to. Man, I wish someone really understood me. Well, if you don't open yourself up and start putting yourself out there, you'll never know. You'll never know. It's like fishing. I kind of throw a little bit of myself out there. If they bite and want to talk about it, they can embrace me and start, you know, I'm not talking about just repeating the problems, but coming to them with encouragement saying, you know, do you got any scripture that could help me with this today? Do you got any praise songs that could help me today? I mean, I, lo- I love singing pra- praise songs. I-, I was painting the house, and Megan, Glenn, everybody that was sending this stuff to, I just felt so encouraged. Man, they're painting all over this place. You know, sending encouraging songs to praise with people. Unlock yourself in the house. You know, let it out. Call on someone else and say, hey, you got anything for today? I'm- I feel dry today. You got anything? Number six, read the Word of God. Praise. Pray in the Spirit. I feel like, I feel like uh, there's times that I've felt that dryness. It's like I have forgot to pray in the Spirit. It's like I have forgot to praise. It's like I have forgot to read the Word of God. And I know that every time it pulled me out of it. Praise is a weapon, man. Praise is a weapon. I'm telling you, it unlocks something in this corporate prayer. You know, corporate praise, I'm telling you, you start... You allow yourself to open up and praise like you praise at home. We dance around our house. I've got kids. I mean, it, it is not, the Lord would say it's a joyful noise, but um, you've got kids beating on stuff. Woo, Jesus! The kids love it. They react to that. They're free in Him to praise and unlocks things. It pulls you out of the mud. I mean, it does. I love it. I love being in a house that loves to praise. I love it. Every time Chris Turtley hits those drums, woo! I feel that the Lord just shake. I'm telling you, man, it's like, you see the angels dance around the stage sometime. I'm telling you, open, you ask him to open your eyes. He'll open your eyes. You'll see it. It's amazing. It's amazing what he does in this house and at our, our houses. It starts at our houses. That's where it started for me. It started with me, my wife, and my kids. That's where it starts. It starts with me unlocking things in that house with the Lord, praising through it, praising through stresses, whatever it may be, financial burdens, I'm going to praise him through it. I'm going to praise him right here. I'm going to dance around that house, and it is going to unlock things and move mountains. It is going to shake down the things that are standing in front of me because they're already gone. Number seven, see where you came from and, where, and what you've overcome. You know, we talk about taking a look back. I've had to take a look back. I do it all the time say, you know what, I've come out of all this. I've come out of all this junk, and look where I'm going. Keep on pressing forward, pressing in. I've overcome this and that, and whatever else tried to hold me down, but I'm going forward. I've overcome. See where you overcome. I feel the Lord saying, let's just, I want to pray with you guys. That was my last, that was my last point, but I really feel it. I just want to pray with you guys. If, if you guys want to stand up real quick. If you can, if you want, stand up. God is so good. Lord, 
you know, we all deal with these things. We deal with emotions each and every day. We deal with struggles. So I just want to just lift your hands. I just want to pray for you. Lord, I just release my family right here. I release them from the things that are not of you. Lord, I pray for supernatural guidance from you. Lord, Holy Spirit, I just pray that you do a marvelous work in this, in this, this family. For the people watching online, Lord, Lord, that they're going to be led by you. Lord, when that, that time comes and they don't know what, what it is or why they're feeling it and they don't know how to release it, that they turn, their eyes are open and they can see you, that they hear your voice. The things that the enemy has tried to put on them, the blinders, they just tried to plug their ears. Can't do it. We're taking it out right now. We're taking it right, right out. Lord, I pray blessing over them. I pray, pray blessing over this week, Lord. Lord, that they will just hear you and continue to hear you. Lord, that, that we're not led by our emotions, Lord. Lord, I just thank you for it. I thank you, Lord, that you're doing a marvelous work in them. I thank you, Lord, that they don't have a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. That you're renewing minds each day. That you're renewing minds with your word. Lord, that they're lining their will up with your will. That it's the perfect will of God. Lord, that they see that who you say that they are, not who the world says that they are. Lord, they continue to see that they are loved. We are loved by an um, amazing God. Lord, I pray that, that we set aside the distractions and listen to you and listen to your voice and not our voice. I thank you for the love, Lord, poured out on them. In your precious and holy name, amen. 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 Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks so much.